I'm super happy to be here um, and I'm super happy to see Catherine and Molly, obviously, um, but also happy Pride. You can see I have the Pride flag behind me because today's Global Pride Day. Um, as you know, a lot of Prides had to be cancelled and postponed, so there is a very big digital Global Pride going on that uh, if you have the time during the rest of the day, you can sneak in on Twitter and some other social platforms maybe. Um, and before I start saying a little bit about the uh, situation with regards to Brexit in the European Parliament and then also obviously the friendship group, I just wanted to say again how much we miss our colleagues from the UK uh, in the group. And I can really say that on behalf of everyone in the Green Group, uh, Molly and Catherine, but also Gina, Ellie, Scott, Alex and uh, Majid. And also, also, uh, also as you know, we had uh, the colleagues from the SNP, uh, Ellen, Eileen, uh, Christian and, and, um, and Heather, who was only there for three days. Um, but they are very, very much missed. And I think uh, the European Parliament really hasn't been the same um, since Brexit happened. So we are still, I think I'm, I'm most, but uh, all of us are still heartbroken about this. Um, but obviously we are in a situation right now where, as you know, the negotiations are ongoing uh, between the UK and the European Union uh, to come down with an agreement on the future relations. Uh, and we have always said uh, as Greens that we want this relation to be as close as possible in the future. Um, and I'm not going to go into all the details if you want to have more specific information on specific fields, but maybe just to give a very brief kind of um, yeah, summary of where we stand in the negotiations right now. And I can tell you that um, already uh, before the COVID crisis started, we had only very, very little time, 11 months to uh, negotiate a very cross-cutting, comprehensive uh, trade and association agreement is something that we had never seen before. Um, so we already said um, we really need to be as uh, efficient as possible. Now with the corona crisis, to be honest, from my point of view, it has almost become impossible um, to really um, yeah, finalize these negotiations. But as you know, the UK government is really insisting on not extending the negotiations. And this, I'm probably not telling you anything new, but this is making it very, very difficult to reach any agreement um, in, in this very short period of time. And what comes uh, also as I would say uh, an additional difficulty is that at least on the European side, we have a little bit the impression that the UK, UK government wants to open up again what was even already decided and agreed upon in the political declaration. As you know, there is already an agreement between the UK and the European Union, the withdrawal agreement, and that was accompanied by a political declaration where, for example, the level playing field um, so that there would not be uh, dumping on social environmental labor standards in the future. And um, this was something that was already agreed on. And now the UK government is trying to uh, open that up again. Um, and I mean, if you have to start again from scratch, um, it doesn't only mean that you need more time to negotiate, but it also means a little bit. And I, I think I'm speaking on behalf of a lot of people in the European Parliament, that the trust that was there, that there was a willingness from the UK government to actually come to an agreement um, has really, really gone down. Um, so uh, as you can see, it's a very difficult situation. Nonetheless, I can only reiterate that we are uh, very committed to try our best to keep the ties as close as possible. And this is also one of the reasons, um, was one of the reasons for me uh, with colleagues uh, across the political spectrum. So from po different political parties, from the conservatives to the liberals and the social democrats, um, obviously with us Greens to form um, a friendship group. Uh, the EU-UK friendship group, some of you might heard about it uh, before already, uh, and we are basically trying to do what um, Paul was already um, pointing to, and that is to create close ties, obviously on a political level, so to create networks between parliamentarians, but also very much on a civil society level. Um, we have seen that the UK uh, now has one of the biggest pro-European citizens movements in the whole of the European Union. And we felt that the people who had been active in these grassroots movements um, should still have an entry point to the European Parliament. Many of them will not be able anymore um, to vote in European elections, obviously. Um, but we still wanted to give the chance um, of UK-friendly pro-European politicians um, to, to yeah, have 
discussions, to organize debates, to come to the UK and to stay in close contact. Um, and secondly, and this is very important, not only with regards to the future relations, but also when we look at the implementation of the withdrawal agreement, many of you might know, and I've also seen in the chat that some of you yourself are in this position, EU citizens in the UK, but also UK citizens in the European Union. So we want to um, give a possibility uh, to citizens who are now concerned by difficulties, um, who have, um, you know, uh, maybe an uncertain situation um, to be voiced in the European Parliament. Also for that, um, we have formed the friendship group. And then lastly, and some of you might have already seen, we want to take initiatives um, to encourage others to, to create closer ties. Um, one of the things that we have pushed for, for example, is to revive um, uh, city, uh, city partnerships, city exchange structures. As you know, a lot of cities uh, in the UK and the rest of the European Union have partner countries, uh, have partner cities in different countries. Um, and I think now really is the time um, after Brexit um, that, you know, there are going to be less exchange, there are going to be less links um, to revive these structures on the local level, on the, but also uh, on a regional level. Um, and obviously also when, when it comes to civil society organizations, when it comes to association, when it comes to sport clubs, to organize as, mu as much exchange as possible. And this is what the friendship group is for. Um, as I said, it's really cross-political, it's cross-party, it's across the European Union. We almost have members from all member states of the European Union. Um, and I hope that for you, um, what we do in the group, um, but also what we do um, as the Greens in the European Parliament can be helpful because I think now it's more important than ever to talk to each other and to exactly create links like uh, we are doing today. Thanks a lot. Uh, Paul, I think you need to unmute. Thanks, Ed. Too many, looking at too many screens at the same time. <laughs> Apologies for that one, everybody. Uh, let's see what I've got here. Yeah, I do. Have, I do have a couple of questions that have, that have already come in. The first one is, uh, how can those of us in the UK who oppose uh, Brexit uh, resist being punished by the EU for things that we didn't have any part of? I think that's, uh, yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> That is indeed a big question and I think it's also really encapsulating um, the feeling of injustice that I have uh, encountered amongst a lot of people from the UK who said that they are being dragged out um, from, the UK, uh, from the European Union against their will um, and that they don't want to be um, want to lose their rights um, because of a referendum that a lot um, see uh, as have been based on misinformation and on lies um, without even having a final say. I can completely understand um, the feeling behind that. Um, and I think what Angela Merkel said, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't have framed it that way. She sometimes has a little bit of a, of a maybe short and rough way of expressing certain things. I think the logic behind it is a little bit, uh, and this is also something that maybe I wanted to use this meeting to, in a way, prepare you for. Obviously, we are in a very difficult situation right now because we are confronted with a UK government that is making claims and demands that are, first of all, not grounded on, as I said, uh, things that have already been agreed on in the political declaration. And a lot of them are also not possible for the European Union to be met because um, speaking on behalf of somebody who has campaigned for environmental standards, for social standards, for tax standards, I mean, Molly was referring to some of the examples where we also had great successes on the European level. If we had um, a kind of social and environmental um, downturn because the UK is not bound um, by certain regulations there, um, really, uh, as you know, a very close a neighboring country, 
this would endanger a lot of these things uh, in the single market in the rest of the European Union. So this obviously for us is a very difficult situation because we cannot agree um, to a deal that in the end would enable that. Um, and as much as I, I agree with the fact that we need to have um, as close relations as possible, they need to be grounded also on certain standards, on reciprocity, um, on a rules-based system that both sides follow. Um, so to have, for example, um, some kind of um, agreement how uh, this food is going to be settled in the future. And if all of this is not in place, then, and I have to be honest there, it is going to be very, very difficult for the European side to say yes. And I mean, as you know, the European Parliament is eventually going to vote on the deal. And only last week, uh, we had a very broad resolution adopted again, which is basically touching upon all the different questions that are being debated, because it's not only trade um, that is still very conflictual uh, in the discussions, also citizens' rights is still something um, where there is a lot of disagreement be between the UK side and the EU side. You have probably heard about the debates around fisheries and the question of data protection, also foreign and security policy, very, very controversial topics. And if the UK government is not willing to, you know, have a little bit of a flexibility on some of the issues and also meet uh, the demands that the EU side has come up with in order to protect the single market and the standards that we have established in the European Union, it's going to be very hard on the basis of, of this resolution in the European Parliament that we have just adopted to vote in favour of such a deal. Yeah. We've got a number of questions I'm pleased to say. Um, the first one from Mike, um, our manifesto for the general election uh, obviously needs changing to reflect obviously leaving the EU. On the other hand, current EU institutions also need reforming. Is there any way that Green parties in the remaining EU member states can help reform the EU? Definitely. I mean, um, the UK might not be member of the European Union anymore, but the Green Party of England and Wales is still member of the European Green Party. So in terms of uh, having a political platform to campaign also for changes in the European Union, you all have this entry point, definitely. But I would even go beyond that. Um, and I can only agree that, yes, European institutions need reform uh, very much as well. Um, and one of the things that um, we have agreed on and um, is going to happen, I don't know exactly the timeline, it was actually supposed to start in May, but due, due to Corona, it had to be postponed. It is the Future of Europe conference which is uh, a conference that is based on citizens' assemblies all across the European Union, where people will come together and debate questions such as how institutionally we want to change the European Union, how we can make it more democratic, for example. But the friendship group in the European Parliament has also always campaigned that UK citizens should probably not in exactly the same terms, but um, should still have a say in this because there has been such a vivid debate over the past years in the UK on the European Union, what is good about it, but also what is bad about it. And yes, I agree, the European Union is far from being perfect. So I think the input that UK citizens could give to this process um, would be very, very useful and very enriching. And this is why we are fighting for that, not only the members of the Green Party, but uh, UK citizens as a whole could actually um, also be part uh, in this. Um, but obviously your voices are still very much needed, um, for example, in the European Green Party, but also in cross exchanges. Uh, we had a very successful exchange between the Green Party uh, of Germany and the Green Party of England and Wales in the past. And I think exactly these kind of links um, should now even be strengthened after Brexit. I think that's going to lead me very nicely onto the next question, which, which Daniel's put forward is, what can we do in the Eastern Green Party to work more closely with our colleagues across Europe and the EU? And I know that's a question that a number of people have raised for me. So that's good. And I think it's probably one of the most important questions um, that we can ask ourselves right now. Um, I mean, I've already said that I believe um, we have to do things institutionally, like the European Parliament, as European parties. But I also think that these local ties um, are very, very crucial. And if I may say, I mean, um, you, you were also referring to, to the referendum and the campaign beforehand. I think looking back, maybe one of the mistakes that were made was that 
you know, if, for example, local groups um, from cities would have invited people from partner cities, I don't know, from France, from Germany, from Spain, just to come really regular citizens to meet each other, to, to exchange uh, about their, their everyday lives. And um, this would have, you know, given a different focus on what is happening in Brussels or what is happening in Strasbourg away from only that and to like, yeah, we have a lot in common with people living in Germany, in Finland, in Italy. Um, and I think that strengthening this would be very important right now. So if you could organize exchanges like this, for that it would also be very important that the UK um, stays in exchange programs such as Erasmus, but there are also exchange progress, uh, programs that go beyond that. And if you could campaign for that in the UK, if you could ask the government, even you know if the trade agreements are difficult and so on and so on, but at least make sure um, that especially young people, but not only, will still have the possibility to get financial support for doing exchange uh, programs also in the future. I think that would be really important for not deteriorating the situation right now, but also for in the future um, to see maybe at some point um, the UK wanting to become part uh, of the European Union again. I know that this is not something that will happen in the next years. They think um, to keep these links and to keep these bridges, um, you need to have these, these local ties uh, as much as possible. Somebody has asked that question about how do we facilitate the twinning of towns and I think that's something that councils can already do. There is a structure for doing that. I think the other part of that is perhaps a, a more party political level of establishing clear links between uh, green parties and green regions in this country with uh, others that are close to us, particularly in the East, obviously. You know, Holland and Germany are only of course the North Sea. Uh, and that's, uh, that's something that we need to work on. I'm just going to pick up on other questions. See what we got. Now, someone says that, that Norwich is twinned with Koblenz in Germany. You have a strong local Green Party. Maybe we should make more of that. Absolutely. Um, Definitely. Yeah, um, and it, some of it's very encouraging that we remain part of the European Green Party. Absolutely, and anyone who doesn't follow that on social media or you have the website uh, or get the journal, they're all great. Um, and I'm on it with Terry on friendship building uh, and ensure that we get back one day. Uh, and Ben says there's some questions in the document, uh, but I'm getting so many comments on here, Ben, it's really hard to monitor them all, but I'll go back to it and see if I can find them. Can I just, Paul, while you're looking for yeah, the sure. question, uh, say one more thing? Because I think, I mean, in the UK, I know because of the electoral system, it is very, very difficult for the Greens uh, on a national level. Um, but I think that um, just like in the UK, uh, in a lot of places, uh, Greens are very, very strong on the local level. We have a lot of local councillors all across the European Union and beyond in, in European countries that are not members of the European Union. And I think that this is also something, if you are working on a local level in a local branch, um, of the Green Party, if you are maybe a local councillor yourself, to really get in contact because a lot of the challenges when it comes to climate change, when it comes to housing, when it comes to traffic, they're very similar in a lot of places. And I think you can have a lot of exchanges and you can also really strengthen these links. And maybe just to say one thing, because I'm in Marseille right now, my girlfriend is from here, so um, I, I, I'm in France. And they are going to be tomorrow, the second round of the local elections. They had to be postponed. They were supposed to happen in March. And then because of the Corona crisis, um, they were postponed uh, now. And Marseille, it's the second biggest city in France, but also Lyon, Besançon, uh, Strasbourg, Bordeaux, all of these cities can actually be won by green mayors. And I think that this has still not really got Round, but it would be such a great success for the Greens, I think, all over Europe if the French Greens um, get just one or two of these really big um, cities in France. And I think it's worthwhile following a little bit tomorrow night, um, maybe on Twitter, um, what is happening. I think the European Green Party is also going to give updates about that and then to see how the Greens did in the uh, partner city that you have in France. 
because they have a little bit the same problem. The electoral system uh, in France, apart from the European election, uh, it's very bad um, for the Greens, um, but on the local level, they're very, very strong. And I think that there you could also build very concrete ties. Got a really good question here, which is, what lessons can the UK learn from the success of the German Green Party? <laughs> Yeah, we discussed this very ex ex extensively. I just have to remind you of one thing. We had the first exchange in Bristol. Molly was also there. Um, and um, we discussed, uh, because that was the moment where actually the Green Party of England and Wales had overtaken the German Green Party in terms of membership. Obviously not in terms of members of the parliament because of the electoral system. Um, and then we were always asking the question, how can we learn from you to get so many members? I think now it, had t it has turned a little bit again and we have some more. But I think, um, yeah, having exactly these kind of questions being asked. I mean, obviously, as I said, it is much, much easier for us because we have proportional representation and then to convince people to vote for the Greens and not to vote tactically like they very often do in the UK. I mean, I have been in election campaigns in the UK. It's much easier. Um, but I think one of the things um, that might be um, important, I mean, f for us has been important um, uh, over the past years is, uh, and I think that this is something that you can do on the local level um, that was really convincing is, um, I mean, we always had the great line, we always had a political compass that was also, and I think that's important, not only about ecological questions, and um, we have always been very profiled and positioned also with social justice, also with human rights questions, LGBTI questions, um, dem democratic uh, renewal, um, but to have these like big debates, but then also really on the ground to have very concrete policies that are making the lives of, you know, everyday people um, better. And I think that this has been um, something that convinced maybe mostly people, um, you know, who might have voted for the Social Democrats, but also for the Conservatives beforehand, that they said in very concrete terms, the Greens, they really stand up for what they say. They're very credible. Um, they also, in terms of, um, you know, standing to, to, for politicians, standing to what they say. I think we have gained a lot of credibility there. And this is why um, over the past years, in a lot of ways, um, we have been very successful. But, and I want to finish with that, not on a negative note, but I think just a, a word of caution. Um, we have had the situation that in between national elections, we have been up to, you know, 20% in the polls. And then before the national elections, we have actually gone down again to, to um, less, which is still great. I mean, getting 10% in the national election is, is still a great result, I think. Um, but we will see what is going to happen next year. We have uh, elections uh, in autumn next year. And uh, yeah, at the moment, it looks pretty good. We are the second strongest party after the Conservatives um, in the polls. Uh, I've got a question here from uh, Catherine, which is my impression is that the EU Council is better off without the UK. Is that right, especially with the decisions on funding for countries after COVID? Well, you know, this is what some people have argued, um, you know, with regards to getting higher social standards through in the European Union, with regards to certain legislation, it is going to be difficult because the UK has always been very hesitant, uh, pushing for more integration in certain fields where it's very direly needed, for example, when it comes to tax competition and so on and so on. I think that, yes, you could argue in certain questions that might be the case, but I think overall, and I'm just going to repeat it, I think it is bad for the European Union um, that the UK uh, has left the EU because, you know, I always say we might be fighting a lot, but I think amongst friends and allies, it's important to fight. And then, yes, sometimes we cannot get through the full, you know, wish list of what Greens would want. Um, but it's more important to be united and to try to find, comprom find, comp uh, find compromise rather than having the UK out. And maybe in terms of a lot of the legislation that then, you know, will go up when, when we talk about environmental standards or social standards in the EU um, have a de de deterioration uh, on the UK side. So, yes, I think in some cases you could argue that, um, but I still think overall um, it would be much more useful to have the UK, maybe sometimes even as a difficult member of the, of the council. 
Um, obviously, this this is someone who's well up with uh, the news of the last 24 hours. Terry, do you have any views on Greens taking part in uh, coalition governments such as the new Irish government, which is just about to come into being where the Greens are with Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael? Well, let's see how it's going to go. I mean, first of all, I think it was very good that they had this um, um, very inclusive process of taking a decision. As you know, they needed a two third majority of the party members to vote in favor. I think they had even more than that. I, I read something of 74%, which I think is a great result. And I think it shows a readiness by the Irish Green Party to give it a try now. And when I speak to my I Irish colleagues in the European Parliament, but also my friends from the Irish Greens, all of them said that obviously with regards to a lot of things, this agreement is not a green program, um, it cannot be, and that um, there is a lot of things that will need to, um, you know, wh where we need to maybe even need more pressure from the street, from civil society uh, to move it forward. But at the same time, they also said that um, some things they are so urgent to be done right now um, with regards to climate change, where I believe Ireland had really been on a wrong track with a, with a lot of uh, policies in the past and where the Greens could have a very, very impactful role now in the government. And this is why a lot of people that I really deeply trust um, have voted in favor of this. Um, as you know, it's not the first time that the Irish Greens are going into government. Um, I hope that this time um, there is going to be um, a very strong green footprint in this government and also on the European level um, they will be able together with the other Greens that are in government to really make a difference in the council because if I can finish by saying that a lot of progressive green policies and I think that Catherine and Molly can probably support that um, it is not the problem to get a majority in the European Parliament. We have on a lot of green issues, majorities in the European Parliament. The problem is that the council has been blocking more progressive legislation on an EU level in a lot of ways, not only in climate, but also for example, when it comes to anti-discrimination policies, when it comes to social policies, we are pushing for having a European wide uh, minimum income directive. Um, and. I think that for that, having more Greens in government and being able to influence the discussion in the council is very, very useful. We picked up another couple here. It says, uh, will uh, Green MEPs continue to campaign for UK residents who wish to keep their EU citizenship? Uh, is that a possibility? <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you have seen this, um, that the, well, the father of Boris Johnson, who apparently I was informed had been a Remainer already before, but that he now wants to apply for French citizenship. Uh, and the first feeling I had was, uh, I can so much understand and I would never blame him for doing that. But at the same time, I just think it was wrong to take uh, EU citizenship away from millions of people to start with. So, um, I think that this is going to be a, a debate that we will have also in the friendship group. Um, it was actually something that we had planned um, for the beginning of next year to see what are entry points for UK citizens um, to retain EU citizenship or whether to include a special category. In the European Parliament so far, this is a very controversial debate. I'm not going to lie about this um, because obviously um, right now, as it stands in the treaties, um, EU citizenship is linked to national citizenship of an EU member state. Um, and with that, it would probably mean that we would need treaty change in order to make it possible. There, I know there's, there are several um, legal um, opinions that also differ from that, but I think there needs to be a deeper debate about um, citizenship and how it can be retained by certain groups that are not members, uh, that are not citizens in the EU member states. Um, but I would also like to raise this very much in the Future of Europe conference, because I think when we talked about the rights of UK citizens and how they will um, interact with the EU after Brexit, a lot of questions actually came up about EU citizens 
all about EU citizenship altogether that have not been fully clarified. We have a little bit of a hybrid now, EU citizenship for itself, EU citizenship linked to national citizenship. Um, and I think that this is something that we will definitely have to uh, follow up on. And for that, I think the, the Future of Europe conference will be a great platform. And then also obviously raising the point of the special position of UK citizens. And I think this, this is a good one too, actually. Uh, should we, obviously, as Britain leaves the EU, we may also leave EU environmental standards. And what should be the concern about the UK's inaction on air quality legislation, given the fact that air, air doesn't have national boundaries? And I think you cannot only apply that to air, but you can apply that to a lot of things. I mean, I think when um, the, uh, the Chernobyl uh, accident happened and then people started realizing, you know, having nuclear power plants, whether they're in the country that you live in or just across the border, um, when there is an accident, it doesn't make a, a difference in terms of pollution that it's going to be created. Um, and yes, there is a very strong concern about exactly that, and not only with regards to environmental standards, but also other standards, like for example, labor and social standards, and that, that there will be an attempt to undermine um, the standards that we have managed to push through on a European level. And this is also why I can only reiterate again, the level playing field would be the important um, uh, agreement, like the basis of an agreement to push for, for the European side to avoid that from happening. Having this kind of, um, you know, creating pressure by downsizing the, the standards on the UK side. And this is also why the European Parliament had, has insisted on it again. Um, Boris Johnson doesn't want it. Um, and I think there is a reason for that because I think the, the Tory government is exactly planning to do that. And with the level playing field, it would be impossible for them. Um, and I think obviously it's in the interest of the EU, but I would also say it's in the interest of UK citizens not to have that possibility given to the Tory government to go down on these standards. And uh, when we talk about environment, when we talk about social, when we talk about labor, um, and this is why uh, we are insisting on it so much. I mean, I don't know, maybe there is going to be a U-turn over the summer uh, with the UK government. So far, I don't really see it, despite the fact, as I said, actually that this had already been decided um, in the political declaration before. Um, and I think the fact that they are now trying to withdraw that and go back from that really speaks volumes about what they're planning to do after the transition period is over. This is quite a lengthy preamble, but the, the question's in the tail. Um, I believe that one of the components of the Brexit vote was the fact that many people did not know what the EU was doing for them. I believe this is the general issue across the EU, contributions made by the EU to food standards, the environment, infrastructure, restoring historical value, buildings. Uh, there's always room for improvement, of course, but here in the UK, we are also finding the importance of EU values and standards. My question is, how can European representatives spread the word and, and advertise and promote their work better to prevent misconceptions? I think this is a really, really important question. And it's a question that I have been asking myself over the past four years since the outcome of the referendum was published again and again, because at least I had the feeling that you know, in the end, people are going to follow um, the economic arguments that there are so many advantages for the UK to stay in the European Union. And apparently, um, as was rightly said, um, this didn't reach a lot of people. And I think obviously that has a multitude of reasons. Um, but I think one of the things um, is that uh, obviously we have to talk more about the positive things. I think there has been a lot of standing up to lies and misinformation, like debunking myth around the European Union, which was a little bit trying to counter the negative discourse, which is very important. But at the same time, I think creating these positive discourses um, you know, that are also not only based on economic arguments. I have said this a lot of times. I had the feeling that on the economic arguments, we won the debate, you know. We had all the statistics, all the data on our side. But I think in terms of the emotional arguments, what people felt, you know, like in take back control, we will be free, we will take our own decisions. This was something that was really won by the Leaf side in the referendum. And I think 
having these, these stories being told of why the European Union, for example, gives people more freedom. I mean, I'm always wondering how can tabloids have a front page saying freedom and then in the subtext by abolishing freedom of movement. So you get freedom by abolishing a freedom. Like to me, this, this really doesn't make sense. But obviously the narrative of what kind of positive um, uh, advantages uh, the EU membership has for UK citizens, um, we have been really too, too quiet maybe, also too assumptive that people will understand. And I think that, for example, um, these kind of projects that were mentioned um, where the EU has invested money into infrastructure, um, where because of Erasmus programs, um, school can, schools can take trips um, to different places, pupils can learn things, people can requalify for jobs because of the European Social Fund, and so on and so on, um, that we should focus on that more um, rather than only kind of countering the, the hateful narratives that are coming from the other side. And, and that's the last point, also to, to making it a little bit more emotionally touching because I felt, you know, the EU is seen by so many people as something that is very technocratic and not so much as something that also means, you know, peace and that means togetherness and that means, you know, standing up for each other when, when somebody is in, in a difficult situation. And I think that these kind of things are very important for people to create a positive reference to what the European Union is. If I can add to that, re recently, obviously, since uh, the lockdown in Britain has uh, been sort of reduced, uh, local councils have been given money to um, do road changes, such as um, narrowing roads, widening pavements, reducing speed limits etc my local authority has been given sixty-seven thousand pounds to do that they're saying oh we've been given this money by government but actually the money's come from the european regional fund um and yeah you know, that's just not publicized you know, yes. so it is getting yeah. that getting that message across last couple of questions here and i think one of them that you've dwelt on is basically how can what can we do to help those who voted leave like i did to educate them so they vote to rejoin next time I think you tackled that perfectly. Um, there's one at the top, however, and that, there's another question which I think has been dealt with. The one at the top uh, hasn't, which there's, um, and yeah, this relates back to, I think, perhaps working in coalitions. Uh, does Terry know how the Austrian Greens are doing in government with the People's Party in Austria? Another uh, um, coalition that uh, we are in as Greens, um, there was a very difficult situation for the Austrian Greens. Um, as you might know, there was a little bit the choice between either the Greens um, going into government or again having the far right in government. I mean, Austria has a very long, very problematic history from my point of view of having the far right in government. Um, and I think in terms of when it comes to climate policies, um, actually the Greens um, managed to achieve a lot of things. Um, for example, expanding rail traffic. Um, now, as you might have seen, Vienna is going to be completely car free from the first, the, the inner city of Vienna, not the whole of Vienna, but the inner city of Vienna. Um, it's, go it's going to be completely car free from uh, the 1st of July onwards. Um, in terms of like fighting for higher reduction, um, uh, emission reduction uh, goals uh, sooner, they were really successful. I would say in terms of maybe more with regards to migration policy, with regards to human rights, with regards to democ questions of democracy, um, the success has been more limited. And I think that this is something that the Austrian Greens are basically suffering from every day. And when I speak to the people who are in the parliament, but also the people who are in the government, they say it's very, very difficult because the Conservative Party in Austria, maybe compared to the Conservative Party in Germany, but also some other Conservative parties across uh, Europe, is, is very right-wing itself already. Um, so I think that they are really, really struggling there. Um, I think they're trying to do their best. Um, but I know that um, some issues have already created a very big upheaval um, um, and are indeed very, very problematic um, fr from a green um, standpoint. 
And I can only say that I think what this example teaches us, but also really what the example of Ireland teaches us is um, that we have to try to fight for strong green results, but also for um, then possibilities of having center-left um, coalitions. There is actually a possibility in Germany, potentially we will see how the election is going to go, um, but that we could go into government um, with the Social Democrats and the left party. And in terms of programmatic overlap, obviously these are coalitions that are much, much better for us uh, when it comes to environmental issues, but mostly also when it comes to social justice and human rights questions.